We are going to be discussing, is 4K the future of film and television? And I think we have some interesting perspectives on that. So, um, actually, let's, uh, let's start uh, with you, John. Do you want to sure. throw in on that? Um, actually, what I would say, uh, 4K is the present. Uh, so, I'd like to advance a little bit. Already, we're starting to see the impact that 4K is starting to make. Uh, in the year 2013, uh, Sony announced it's uh, the first uh, 4K download service uh, for 4K. And we have already have 140 titles uh, that are available on that service. And at CES this year, Netflix uh, announced that they're going to start streaming in the first part of 2014 4K titles, uh, so that's real-time streaming, and they will have uh, one of their original series, uh, House of Cards, uh, which will be delivered in 4K. And Sony is going to remaster Breaking Bad in 4K, so you'll have House of Cards followed by Breaking Bad available uh, from Netflix in 4K. Um, and that's just the television side on the uh, cinema release side, 4K has been in place now for uh, a number of years. Uh, this past year, uh, you had uh, titles like After Earth and Oblivion uh, launched. Uh, Oblivion obviously was a big hit. Uh, so that was shot, in fact, with the camera that Full Sail has, the F65. And uh, in other areas, you're starting to see the impact of 4K, not necessarily for 4K delivery, but as a tool in the HD world. So a lot of sports, in fact, the Super Bowl had a half dozen what we call 4K live systems used uh, this year. NASCAR, which is happening this weekend, have another couple. And what they do is they use the 4K uh, resolution so that they can zoom in and get much more detail so they can bring it to the home viewers without the artifacts that we, you would have if you zoomed in and cut out HD. So uh, that's just a sampling, and we'll get much more into this as we go on. But 4K is now. Yeah. And Sam, you were mentioning that earlier that uh, YouTube is also uh, has 4K offerings. Yeah, I mean, um, it's already kind of here, and it's only going to get faster and, and more efficient. Uh, H.265 is also coming, which is going to... Um, basically, you're going to start seeing things come over the cloud and delivered in 4K. I mean, how many of you guys are actually shooting in 4K at this point? There so there's a few hands. Is there anyone who's finishing in 4K? Mm. We got one. Okay, <laughs> that's going to be changing over the next couple years because basically, at the end of the day, it's really easy to acquire and deliver. And actually, there's a there's a 4K camera coming from Blackmagic, uh, which is going to be a couple thousand dollars. There's the Panasonic GH3, and you're going to have CES of this year where you can get 4K panels starting at $650 if you need. You know, so it's just another resolution, and that's what I think a lot of people don't quite understand is, you know, it's just double 1920 by 1080, even though it's four times the amount of pixels. It's just a resolution, and you can work natively with it, whether it's Final Cut 10 or Premiere Pro or any of these other things, and off the new Mac Pro, you know, we had an event a couple weeks ago where we're showing off 16 streams of 4K playing in a multicam off the new Mac Pro and Final Cut 10. <laughs> and you can cut with it live, and it's just not a big deal. And um, with all of the new panels that are gonna be coming out, you're gonna see a need for content. So for you guys, if you want a little bit of a competitive advantage, start looking into how to start and finish in 4K, because, hey, guess what? Out of your MacBook Pro laptops, you can actually have a 4K screening right out of your timeline through QuickTime. And, um, and be at a higher resolution already than pretty much um, any feature film that you see, which most of which are mastered in 2K. So out of your little laptop, you can actually, believe it or not, have a higher quality screening for free coming through an HDMI cable um, than you can at, at a multiplex. So think about the applications of some of that. So that would be my intro to 4K, I guess. Is, it's just not a big deal. 
And just along the lines with HDMI, it's going to go to 4K 60p with HDMI 2.0 that was just standardized. Uh, that's exciting. No limitations uh, to your home TV. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's, and you're going to see it in sports. You're going to see acquisition, delivery coming. You're probably not going to see it as much in broadcast because of the cable and the pipeline coming uh, down the line. But it's, you know, you're going to see it. You're already seeing 4K in the cloud. And as wireless and broadband gets stronger and more powerful, um, it's going to be really easy to download and watch 4K content. The panels aren't that expensive. At a certain point, 4K projection isn't going to be that expensive. So in terms of, um, you know, it's not 3D where you need to work completely differently. Uh, it's just a different resolution. And uh, Ron, from the standpoint of, um, of facility design, um, what do you see as, uh, what's the, the demand that you're seeing in that area? Well. Again, I mean, it, it is really just, um, you know, an expanded resolution. And so our pipeline, what we build, the infrastructure that we build today can easily accommodate 4K. So we're still seeing most of the professional screening rooms and theaters that, that I'm involved in working in 2K, but the projectors, the, the IMBs and the projectors can handle 4K. So whether or not you get a... 4K engine, you know, so you can actually project. That's you know just another component in the in the pipeline. So we don't really design the facilities any differently for 4K. We just know that we have the capability to upgrade to that when the client is ready to go there. You know, and just to add something, I think that um, shooting in 4K whether you finish in 4K or not, and I personally want to finish in 4K, but I haven't seen any of my stuff actually projected in 4K. I've seen it on the smaller panels, but you know, it's, it's uh, difficult to get into a large theater that has 4K projector. <clears throat> but the, um, the acquisition at this point, I think is crucial, so that my footage is archived for down the road when there is a, um, a better way to deliver the material to the, um, you know, to the public, to the general public. So, and um, well, uh, we've got a, a number of different stages within the process. We've got the origination of the image, and um, I think there's, pr it's probably um, easy to agree that that we're arriving at the point where. We're getting close to film um, imagery in terms of s sensor capabilities. We're getting sensors that are uh, more organic in um, in their codecs. Uh, the uh, the depth and and scene brightness range of the imager is is um, as broad as the modern film stocks. So. Uh, where do you see um, where do you see any limitations from that end or opportunities um, that are arising from the shift of 4K, and that can probably uh, you know this can work down the entire line here. All of you uh, are touching it at some point or another. I mean, what's I mean, we started it, it, kind of looking at this panel and thinking about what am I going to talk about. I mean, my background is, is post-production. I do post-production supervision. I'm red, green, colorblind, and I focus on sound. So I was like, hmm. Um, but is 4K the future? I, I agree. It's the present. Um, it reminds me a lot of the conversations we were having years and years and years ago about HD. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's interesting to hear uh, from Sam about, uh, and, and the new Mac Pro and the new Final Cut X um, kind of coming in the same rebel fashion that Final Cut came in with HD. When you know everybody thinks about feature films and stuff, there's, there's a really heavy presence with Avid. It's, it is a market leader, um, but you can't truly work with 4K 
yet in Media Composer, and we're looking for other options and things like that. When you're acquiring it, I'm I'm a huge proponent, like acquire in 4K if you could require, you know, and soon we'll be talking about, you know, shooting 8K, and is there a limitation to how far digital is going to go, and is it going to surpass film? I, I believe it will. There's a lot of questions is, as soon as we go past 8K, are we going to see a difference in it? I think it's, it's like super um, audio sample rates. You know, there's, you know, we have a 20 to 20 hertz, 20,000 hertz that we can hear, but we record in 192, and there's a feeling and a presence of recording at these higher sampling rates that feels better. So is it going to feel better when we're, when we're looking at 8K or, you know, dare I say it's 16K? I, th I think there is, and I think it will just continue to grow. Um, and the skeptical part of me, it's just we haven't found a way to efficiently finish it and you know, getting into that, and I'm really doing a lot of research on my own to figure out a way to successfully finish and to deliver in a format that you can play with the same reliability, um, believe it or not, as, as tape. You know, back when you know, HD cam SR, you play it, it will work. Playing streams, that, that doesn't always work. So the digital workflow, very important, but it still has a way to go in order to be finished to where it's reliable to what we all know and love in the, in the film and in the video world. All right, uh, there's many different directions I could go with this one. Uh, we'll start with color reproduction. Uh, actually, 4K RAW uh, has a very uh, similar workflow to film. Uh, but the color reproduction is actually greater than that of film. So uh, the ability, uh, one of the great tests in video is always can you reproduce the Coca-Cola red? It's one of the challenges. And with uh, 4K RAW, no problem. I mean, so anything that you could do in the film world as far as color re reproduction, dynamic range, uh, you can do with 4K and it's actually more efficient so you could do it more easily. Uh, from there, uh, I'll, I'll let Sam get more into the workflow part of it, but I will say the workflow has come a long way. I was at an event only a couple of days ago in Philadelphia. There was a, uh, a screening of 4K that was being shot currently in Sochi. Uh, it was sent back, uh, and this is uh, by NBC Universal, uh, Comcast, the parent company, was doing the screening. And it was sent back, XAVC, all the way back to Philly, edited, um, and uh, then shown on the TVs. And the workflow was actually ex extraordinarily um, easy. And uh, Sam will get into a little bit more of those details as only he can. But I, I would argue that the workflow is actually being completed not only from the editing standpoint, but the delivery all the way through set-top boxes to the televisions themselves that will, in fact, the Sony Bravias this year will have HEVC decoders inside the TVs themselves, making it that much easier to show 4K. Uh, so I'll stop there. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, to, to piggyback on that, I mean, you guys don't really realize how good you have it. I sound like the old guy, you know, on the panel, like back in my day, but like, you know, film school, 10, 12 years ago, you know, we, I, you know, it was this weird mixture between a Steenbeck and an Avid and all of these tools that cost hundreds of thousands of dollars, you know, just to even get in the door and get going and, and get learning. And um, now there, there's literally, there's, there's no barrier. I uh, actually, believe it or not, cut in 5K off my laptop uh, an entire short, you know, finished it 15 minutes long, um, and had a G-Raid, you know, a laptop, Retina MacBook Pro, and a G-Raid. That's literally what you need, and you go over Thunderbolt, and you can get this done if you know what you're doing. And then, you know, that's exponentially more possible. I mean, DaVinci Resolve, you can finish in 4K for free. Not a lot of people know this. You can do the light flavor of... Um, <coughs> 4K HD, which is Quad HD. There's two flavors, in case you guys are wondering. There's the DCI Cinema Spec, which is 4096 by 2160, and then there's Quad HD, which is what you see in the home TV, which is 3840 by 2160. And if you want to really understand how that works, just double 2K resolution is 4096, and double 1920 by 1080, that's 3840 by 2160, that's Quad HD. 
That's all you need to know. It's just double the existing HD specifications. But the bottom line is that like this just, you know, you guys can do things. Like I remember I had the uh, DVX100 and what was the, the Sony camera from, from the XL1, I think. Okay. I was on the XL1 and we'd have these little mini DV tapes and like sometimes the deck would eat them and like all this stuff would, you know, it was awful. And we were dealing with these, this little standard definition resolution and you're trying to compete against, um, you know, studio movies if you're in the independent film, film side of things or, you know, you're making content. But at this point, if you guys as students, you can, you know, at similar prices shoot at the exact same resolution with the exact same gear that anyone in the world can get access to. And that, you know, should be really exciting for you guys because there's really no limits and no excuses at this point in terms of making and delivering your own content. And for me, that's the big breakthrough. It's like, if you know what you're doing, you are not handcuffed anymore. <laughs> There's a, there is a lot of, uh, a lot of d different uh, directions that we can go with this conversation, but to add to something John said, and I think to your point was, you know, what's happening with sensor technology and how is that going to, <clears throat> to uh, meet or exceed what can be done currently with film? Um, and there is a camera manufacturer who claims to be able to have as good a resolution as 65 millimeter film today. But <clears throat> are we seeing it finished that way? No, it's not, not there yet. And um, we'll see. We'll see if that comes about in the near future. Um, but I think, to John's point, the codex, what really are what's really going to make this technology work for um, for everybody from the professionals all the way down to the home um, TV panels that the better we get with compression technology the better the more we can stream um, <clears throat> the more we can store on our hard drives and that's one of the big problems that I have in the field is how much hard drive do I have to take with me to Indonesia, you know, and, you know, how many terabytes and make sure it all gets back with me. But being able to shoot that, store it, work with it, um, and eventually play it, you know, it really relies on, you know, improving Kodak technology. So I'm looking forward to um, H265, HEVC, and hopefully you start seeing that in some little pocket-sized devices that we can plug into our computers and make that work on your retina machine. <laughs> <laughs> I think there are a number of uh, areas in which the independent filmmaker or the, even the student filmmaker uh, can be interested in this. Um, we've got <clears throat> one thing that's important is, and this was something John was talking about, is the consistency of the image from beginning to the end, and you were also addressing that, the importance of being able to um, shoot something, see it that way, see that color fidelity and, and the uh, fine detail in the highlights and shadows, and then be able to bring that all the way out to the consumer uh, with, with the same quality uh, to the image and the same color depth, and, um, and that's going to be a real challenge to create that, that cinema quality uh, presentation all the way to the screen, uh, whatever that delivery format is, whether it's on the web or whether it's to, um, to uh, a home uh, widescreen at home or in the cinema. Um, and um, <clears throat> the older systems of, you know, five to ten years ago, the NTSC was was never the same color twice. And that's something that we've been um, fighting with for generations, and hopefully that'll be resolved in with the new codecs that are uh, being developed. Uh, Can I say something about yes, that? Yes, absolutely. So, um, <clears throat> that's a good point, because if you're looking at cameras, you know, HD cameras, DSLRs, things like that that are currently available, <laughs> you have a baked-in look. It's what Canon gives you. It's what your, you know, 5D Mark III or, you know, D800, whatever that <clears throat> um, look that they bake into the image, that's what you get. 
and Sam can speak more about this in terms of pushing around color, but when, you know, Sam actually graded a, a film of mine, <clears throat> and when you're working in raw, it kind of looks like crap just looking at the raw, you know, the log, and you got to push it around to make it look like something. So shooting raw, you know, again, to John's point, um, is cru crucial to the way we work and to how things are going to look at the end of the day. We're not locked into a baked look that we get from certain cameras. Yeah, I mean, I think that's, that's a good point. And also some things that you guys probably should understand a little bit too is um, one of the real you know, advantages of shooting raw is the latitude that you have, but also just because you shot raw doesn't mean that you can do anything. So um, you can do far more with skin tones and you can do far more with um, secondaries and you're not going to get all kinds of aliasing and, and banding, but it's also not a replacement for not lighting. Right. And um, basically the big thing that you need to keep in mind is don't underexpose. At the end of the day, that's like rule number one is if you have two people talking and it looks dark on your monitor, bringing up the raw settings isn't going to save you. So, um, you know, the, the key to keep in mind is like exposure, composition, all these other things, that's like number one. And then these other tools will help in that process, but they're not a replacement. And, uh, you know, it's still at the end of the day, it's about kind of shooting and delivering a high quality image. And then you can take advantage of some of the raw settings like the Sony has some really kind of amazing things they're doing with, um, you know, depth of field in some of these, or not depth of field, but what is the uh, dynamic range? Yes. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, and, you know, it, there's amazing things that you can do to save certain things, but if you want to keep in mind on a raw workflow, especially, just do this. Expose the skin tones, keep a little on the top, a little bit on the bottom, and then you can, you can basically do whatever you want. You know, just make sure there's a little room, don't clip, and expose for the skin tones, and, it may look milky and the contrast may not be there, but you're going, you will have full latitude in that image moving forward from there. And there can be a lot of confusing things, but that's the big thing to take away in a raw workflow. And on the 5D and 7D and some of these other cameras, you don't have near the amount of latitude that you have on the raw side. And the H.264 codec is not really ideal for editing. Um, and you, you can expose and get that baked in look like, like you talked yeah, about. You can get there if you want to. You can get there, but you better start there. And that's, you know, right. that's the difference, I guess. Yeah, the, uh, I think if you are looking at, from, uh, from a student's point of view, if you're looking at how do I approach uh, creating media, uh, first of all, you have to understand the sensor. You have to understand its uh, what it's capable of doing. And then once you know that, you have to light to that, and you have to understand where your exposures lie by using uh, the various tools you have, light meters, histograms, um, and what have you. And if you can master that, then you can handle any situation. Uh, then it's just contingent on your budget for, <laughs> you have to <laughs> be able to stay within that. Uh, but uh, getting the right image is, is, is everything for every client that you're going to work for. Um, if you don't, then they're going to pay a lot of money on the back end to try to fix it. Yeah, there's really no such thing as fix it in post. It's, you know, please don't ever say that. <laughs> <laughs> it always happens. Though. Well, we used to say fix it in the mix. That was yeah. Yeah. yeah, there you go. <laughs> Which means re-record it, right? Mm, pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit. You know. um, so, uh, John, you had mentioned that uh, the use of, um, of 4K in the Super Bowl. Uh, would you want to talk a little bit about that experience this year? Uh, yes, it's actually a, a little bit of a breakthrough. Um, in the past, uh, especially football, but it's really applying to all sports, uh, with the increased resolution of the home TV, we'll start with HD and the fact that they're getting bigger and bigger. Um, places like the, the leagues like the NFL, but all other sports too, uh, there's much more pressure on them to get the call right. 
and the networks in order to create a better production, a better home viewer experience. They're searching for new ways to get every detail to the home viewer. And this is going to even increase more as uh, folks at home have 4K TVs and that are up to 85 inches in size or greater. Uh, so leading up to the Super Bowl, in fact, for most of the NFL season, they've been using the Sony F55 camera. And they've been taking the 4K RAW out of the back of the camera through a 10 gig fiber into a baseband processing unit. So you see all the, the power of that. And then they're going into a debarrer unit, which is the BPU, the baseband processing unit, and we're taking the Quad HD out. And it's going into a, a server. In the case of the NFL, they were going into uh, an EVS server. And they were using Aja uh, software to do cutout and zoom. So if you can imagine, you have a 4K palette and you can then search for where the play took place. Zoom into that exact spot where the controversy exists and then blow that up to get an amazing amount of detail. Not only is that being forwarded back to the home viewer so they could see exactly whether or not it was the right call, it's going to the referee booth on the field so they can get the call right. And there were a number of games that were overturned because of that detail. In high def, what would happen is as you'd blow it up, you'd have artifacts around the shoe or the hand. And those artifacts were blurred the difference between being inbounds and out of bounds. Now they're taking that same thing and they're applying to this weekend at the Daytona 500. They're taking the two 4K cameras and they're putting it on each turn. So if there's a crash, they'll be able to zoom in to the cause of the crash. As you know, with wind shifts and racing at the speed that they're going, or if one car just touches another, that could be the difference in why someone went into the wall or not. And be able to get that detail that you cannot get in HD, they'll be able to bring that to the home view. And that makes a big difference in the viewing experience, but not only in the viewing experience, but the outcome of a game like football. So it's, it's really an exciting breakthrough. No one's been able to take all of that detail, like that 4K raw, and get it down to a DeBerry unit. And now we've been able to make that breakthrough. On the other side of that, we're using the RCPs and the CCU that normally goes with HD cameras. So you could ride the iris and shade the camera just like you would an HD camera. And as you can imagine, in a football game that goes from 4 p.m. to 7 p.m., you have to ride that iris. So all the controls that you have with HD now is being applied to a 4K camera, and you're getting these incredible results. I think that he touches on something that's really interesting there is like, you know, a lot of people think that video is just for film and some of these other things in storytelling, but there's a whole host of other applications where I think 4K is probably going to play a big role. I mean, there's the medical industry as well, where like being able to zoom in and really see what's going on in the human body and, and there's certain things that are happening on workflow where like, having multiple 4K cameras and being able, you could, there's 4K GoPros at this point, believe it or not. And, um, you know, having this much resolution and being able to zoom in and do some of these things, I think it's gonna open up to a lot of different um, industries outside of film and TV. And I think you're gonna start see video not just be a content creation and, and sports, I think you're gonna start seeing it everywhere and also because the workflow is getting easier and it's easier to use and bring these files in, it's going to become easier for people in other professions to apply some of that to their field. So um, on the 4K side, being able to zoom in, you know, like whether it's sports or some of these other things, people are like, well, I don't know where 4K is going to apply, but that's, I mean, like, why not do it, you know, is my question, since you can acquire it and the sensors are that big anyway why not have that resolution where you can do things like that? Or, by the way, if maybe your movie didn't come out exactly the way that you had it in mind and you know your best take is actually in your wide shot, wouldn't you rather be able to pop into a medium shot in your 1080 timeline? So like, there's another application right there and being able to work from that and have the flexibility to kind of fix some things that didn't go perfectly. Uh, or also to do a you know, turn a, a static shot into a dolly shot just by doing, you know, pan and zoom. Um, there's, sort of. having the extra resolution, it's not going to look stretched anymore. So even if you're still living in a 1080 world, there's tons of reasons to go, you know, 
as high as you can go on the resolution side and, and that your storage will allow you to, you know, and the speed of your storage. And by the way, there's a new version of Thunderbolt now where you can get 1,200 megabytes a second and you can play 6K natively in a timeline off, you know, off a of Dragon and, you know, any other codec or 6K ProRes is not a big deal. So, like, you're not limited anymore because the technology and the gear is so good. So. One thing I wanted to get back to was um, we talked about skin tones and um, the, um, I think uh, the color of, um, color of skin tones is one important thing, but also as we move toward these higher resolutions, we see more, we see more detail. And of course that uh, is going to present some issues. Um, and and <laughs> because, uh, yeah, you, you look at uh, Danny Aiello and, um, and his face, and yes, on film, even um, it, it's a dramatic face, but you put that on 4K or 6K or 8K sensor. and wasn't HD just beautiful when it first <laughs> yeah. came out. Uh, they, yeah. People look great. <laughs> no. Well, uh, there were a lot of problems with yeah. HD in the beginning, um, just coming out with uh, filters that would work for it without breaking it up too much. And now we're introducing a whole new uh, series of sensors that, that have even greater resolution. And um, the actresses... They're going to hate us, you know, for that. So, uh, so as a cameraman, you want to talk about that a little bit, just a minute? Well, I'm probably not the best person to talk about skin tones. Well, the sharks, I, I, I mean, might make a difference to the sharks. I just going to talk about blue water. I can talk about Of blue course, water. the detail. <laughs> yeah. Of course, the detail that you can get out of a uh, Komodo dragon is yes. going to be awesome. True. <laughs> so. Um, shark skin, you know, you're going to be able to see the You fine. do get all that detail. Yeah. Um, and I did shoot um, the uh, Epic Monochrome um, last year out here in, uh, off, of, uh, off of Florida in Bimini, and that has an amazing amount of latitude. It's a black and white sensor, native ISO 2000, and I was getting, you know, fantastic latitude from you know, it was white sand bottom and sunny skies were only 24 feet of water, <clears throat> but the sharks are mostly black, black and gray, mm -hmm. and just the contrast of that is And you're amazing. still able to hold uh, able that to hold it dynamic hold range. It through, even shooting up and yeah. getting sunlight rays. The sun. and, mm -hmm. yeah, so. Very interesting. Um, yeah, I mean, on, like, on the skin tone side, uh, you're... Act actresses are, are going to have some problems with it. Um, and you're going to see a lot of people re requesting, uh, you know, skin softening and some of these other things, which is not a big deal to add, but, you know, it's, it's going to be, it's going to have a little bit more of an airbrush feel because you're going to be able to see every detail and you're going to have to be a little bit more careful with makeup as well because you're going to see when that makeup is completely obvious. And... So that's one of the things. And the other thing that actually a lot of people don't talk about in 4K is VFX and compositing workflows, which it's far harder actually to get good looking VFX and compositing because you have to be a lot more thorough in your attention to detail because you're literally seeing everything. So that is something that like, you know, for practical effects and practical acquisition and a lot of that stuff, 4K works very well. But if you have, you know, on the digital side, I think that's one place where it's still going to take a little bit of time is in VFX and compositing and 3D and all these other things. We're adding that whole other layer of resolution is going to make everyone's job a little bit harder. So that's something also to keep in mind if you're planning something on 4K and you need to do high level compositing, you really need to research your workflow before you try it. Uh, listen, there's always uh, technical adjustments that are made as we improve the resolution. I do know uh, when HD came out, there were a lot of concerns by, the, uh, I, I guess, especially the female anchors were a little sensitive to it. Uh, so we did things uh, with skin tone uh, that made adjustments as you got closer, and then the, the adjustments uh, went away as you got further, so you wouldn't soften the picture too much. And so those adjustments will still be continued to be handled through technology, but 
I like to think we'll get to the point where we embrace these flaws. <laughs> well, I think that what it's offering is far greater than its detriments, you know, or, yeah. or its problems that we have to solve at the moment, um, in that uh, we can get color accurate on logos. A, a, a great percentage of the work that's done in the world is for some corporate client, uh, whether it's their commercial work or their corporate image work, and for every company like that, their logo colors, their branding colors are their god. That so you have to, you have to match those accurately, and um, and that was a problem, um, you know, 20 years ago. But the uh, quality of the sensors is getting us to the point where we can we can um, even different shades of purples or uh, blues will um, render uh, pretty close to what what they are, and, and of course, the, I think some of the latest sensors that we've seen, um, both with the Epic and, and the uh, F65, F55, uh, are giving us so much larger uh, color space uh, with, with high bit rates um, as well as um, 444 color, so, so we're, getting, we're getting as much as as we need, really. Yeah, it's way better than it used to be. I mean, um, you know, the, well, the other problem actually is more on the display side, to be honest with you, because mm -hmm. you can have a really, I mean, I've, I've been a colorist for a while, and the major issue is you'll do something for a client, and then you'll shoot them out the quick time, and they'll be like, well, this looks terrible. And it's like, well, what monitor are you looking on? Because right. they're not calibrated. So they're looking at their laptop next to a window, and they're like, it looks dark. You know, and it's like, well, that's kind of because of your environment. So um, part of it's on the display side where you have to understand how the image works. And, but you can see anything you want to see at this point. And the question is, what environment do you want to be in? I mean, if you walk through Best Buy, you're going to have 10 TVs in a row playing the exact same thing. And each one of them is going to look different. So which one is right? And how do you know and how do you tell the difference? Um, and there is a right one, but probably it's not in the store. <laughs> and, um, and that's part of the problem. But, you know, I'm hoping that, well, I don't know, since we've got you here, are we getting any closer to some of this stuff? I, I think we are, actually. Uh, at CES in January, we saw huge improvements in the 4K TVs where um, a lot of the attention was paid to the dynamic range. So as we're able to bring forward that extra, res not just resolution, but dynamic range and all the qualities inherited in there, um, the consumer TVs are starting to react to that. Uh, the other part of, uh, on the consumer side, where, where I believe the advantages of 4K are going to be seen, I think there's going to be an explosion in size. Mm -hmm. What's great about 4K, unlike high def, if you sit back 10 feet, 15 feet from your high def set, everything looks great. As you get closer, it starts to fall apart a little bit. That's why there's suggested viewing distances for high def. So a lot of people have been asked, and we started out with why 4K? Well, as you get closer with 4K, there's no degradation in the, in the video. In fact, uh, it's a more immersive experience. So I believe, I don't know how many years, those displays are going to explode in size. They may not even be flat panel LCDs anymore. They could be type of panels that go right onto the wall. I don't know. But there won't be limitations on the size based on correct viewing distance because of the immersive nature of the extra resolution dynamic range that you're getting. So I, I think the consumer display side is going to be really exciting. And uh, it's just starting with HDMI 2.0. We're not limited now to 30p, 40k, 30p. We can get right out to 60p. And we're not limited in where you can sit in size. So uh, you can have a small apartment with a huge display and really have a cinema experience. So some really cool things happening. Yeah, and one thing to, to touch on there, one thing you guys should know about 4K is if you stand up next to it and you look on it in a small pattern, uh, on a small monitor, like a 30 inch or something, you'll see the difference, but you need to be close to it. But you don't really start to see, as he said, in the larger panels, that's what's gonna be coming. You don't really start to see 4K until you hit 84 inches at a traditional um, viewing distance. So 
when people are like, well, I don't really see the difference is because, you know, the panels are not necessarily um, as large as they're going to be yet where you're really going to see the difference. And it's going to get there, but it's one of those things where, like, 84 inches at a typical, like, viewing distance, that's where the resolution is going to make a difference. And then when you see 4K on a big screen, which is, I think, where the most natural application is going to be, it's kind of amazing. So if you've ever seen 4K on, like, a 65-foot screen, I think you've seen it, too. It's yeah. kind of awesome. Yeah. Um, and <laughs> if you can acquire, why not finish there and then work your way down in deliverables as opposed to what a lot of people do now, which is they'll scale up from 2K because that's easier. But you don't really have to do that anymore. You can start in 4K, and then when it makes sense to display that way, that's just what you do. And then if you're in 1080, you're going to have a 1080 master that you can make from your 4K master. And it's, you know, it's like the idea of like still photography where typically you're only going to have a web upload of a photo, but your photo was off like some crazy high-end sensor, but you don't even recognize it anymore because it doesn't feel like a big file to you. Mm -hmm. And that's the way video is going to be at a certain point. Well, we did um, a test uh, a few years ago with um, the SXRD 4K projector on the dub stage here at Full Sail, and it was, it was incredible. We have a twenty uh twelve by uh, twenty six by twelve foot screen playing back four K. It was off a massive QViz server at the time. Um with but I mean the image quality was amazing and great once you we have an eighty plus inch um four K display on the on the truck right outside of the school. If you haven't seen that, there was stuff we shot right outside of um in the back lot with um Guys spinning around a sparkler shot in 4K, and it was—it's just—it's—it's—it's it's, it's amazing. And the fact that when when working on on independent films, going from film to film is such a cost expense. It's always been a cost expense. It was crazy. But we did we did a film three years ago that we shot in 4K, um, did color correction, had issues of how's is it how was it going to go back to the theater, and there was questions about on the display, you know, it looked one way in color correction and one, one way in the laptop. And me as a post supervisor, I said the first thing we need to do is make a digital cinema package, take it to a theater and play it on a projection screen. And what we did is sent it off to a friend of mine in Universal through FTP. He made a DCP, sent it back to us. It was an MXF file with JPEG, um, 2000 uh, image sequence on there, plugged it in, it was on my key, it was an eight gig Lacey key thumb drive on the back of a Sony projector at Winter Park Regal Cinemas, loaded the sequence onto the server and hit play. It was, it, it really was that, it, I was dumbfounded. I was like, I just put my, my USB thumb drive like I would put in my laptop into a projector and perfect, well, in that case of the film, unperfect, very bad color correction problems came out on the other end of it. But I mean, at least we knew, and we knew instantly. Um, and, it's, and it's not beyond the reach of any independent or student filmmaker to, you can make your own DCP at home. You, you can download forms and how to do it. I'm sure Sam could tell you way more than I could, but you can you can do this and test it yourself. And it's it's not without your, it's all within your reach. It's, it's very easy. Just have to know what to look for. Yes. <laughs> uh, just going back to uh, a lot of the uh, television studios are already anticipating that the display side is going to catch up, and the acceptance by the consumers is going to be very very quick. Uh, to the point that they now are shooting a lot of their current shows, like uh, Blacklist. They're being shot with 4K cameras mm -hmm. uh, for HD release, but the archive is all in 4K. So as it goes into right. syndication, they'll be able to get re-released in 4K. If you just think back for a second, can you imagine if you were in the black and white age and move into color, if you shot everything in black and white, and then you had to recolorize or colorize it for, that's a huge expense. Well, they learned from the past and they're already shooting with 4K cameras all of these TV shows, everything from Community to Blacklist to Master of Sex, I could go on. All are being shot with 4K cameras, they're all being archived, even though it's HD released today. That's because the studios realize this is coming and it's coming very quickly. Yeah, even uh, Warner Brothers in their uh, motion picture imaging department, they've taken as much film as they can and scan it at 4K. I mean, it's massive archival rooms, you know, three, four times the size of this, twice the height, you know, 
crazy amounts of film, and they're just scanning this, and scanning it at high, high resolution for data storage for future broadcast. Right, and that's a, a, a great deal of money that's just sitting in their vaults, and there are many, 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 many films that haven't even been touched. You know, what's, what's cool about that, I was just thinking with scanning the film and the, the beauty of 4K displays at your home, is that there was always, there's always been this debate, of, is film better than digital, is digital better than film, but wait until the day when you see a film that you saw you know, 20 years ago look better than when you saw it in the theater because now it's on a 4K display at your home. I mean, it's going to... It's going to happen. It's going to be crazy. So then, I don't know who wins at that point. That's <laughs> but, we all do. Yeah, <laughs> we, yeah, we exactly. all do. <clears throat> a couple of things that have been said uh, I find interesting. The, the fact that we're, one, we're looking at potentially within the next few years with these much larger displays, um, a cinema experience at, in the home. Um, if, if you have an 84-inch screen or larger, 100 108 inch or even larger than that, uh, you can't get very far away. I mean, you can't get far enough away in order to even encompass the entire image. So you're going to be very involved in that image. It's going to be more engaging for the audience, and it's going to improve that uh, experience for every consumer as well. So that'll be an interesting change. Uh, it be interesting to see what happens in terms of uh, cinema um, uh, presentation as well. What are they going to do to top where they are now in order to bring people out to the theaters? So what Add more sound. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yes. So, oh. yes, Mike, that will yes. be your, yeah. <laughs> your job. Yeah, part of it. Shoot up. Yeah, shoot and, up. <laughs> and that I, I, have it, I have it right here on, on my phone, Dolby Atmos. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's, um, there's there's um, a huge um, benefit in, in digital cinema, uh, that we find ourselves with sound, with with going to film, we would do a, a you know Dolby Printmaster, DTS Printmaster, SDDS was the biggest, you know, in seven point one, but five speakers across the front of the screen, nothing really enveloping with that. But Atmos is is amazing. I mean, the, my first Atmos experience was uh, the, the film Gravity, and it was weird to hear like George Clooney like right right here, right right, and then going over your head and then moving around and. <laughs> Um, so yes, can you have an you know an 84 or 105 inch screen at home with you know 5.1 or even 7.1? Um, but you know, it's it's still hard to do. I mean, I'm married. My wife loves the fact that I'm a sound engineer, but I have surrounded my house. But I wouldn't have speakers all over the place, and it would be difficult to do that and still make it a functional living room. So, I, I mean, we're not going to see Atmos at, at home, I, you know, we're not 64 channels, but having Atmos and Oro and the experience that the, the mixers uh, can do, and uh, if you get the chance to meet Juan Peralta, he's doing it now in Captain America 2, and the, the panning of objects um, is pretty incredible, where you can take a sound and say, I want it to move over your head, and then stop, and then kind of come down, and we have height now. Um, mix that with 3D, and it's it's an amazing experience, you know, that I would still think that would keep people in the theaters. And then they showed, uh, we were talking yesterday about um, the uh, the M and E for like foreign release. So you do the domestic release, and that's you know what everybody really cared about when they were mixing the film. And then we make that music and effects only mix, and then send that off to be dubbed in other languages. But with Atmos, you have object panning. So the object is being moved around the room. Um, going completely away from 4K, but stay with me. Um, <laughs> when, you, when you go back with foreign dialogue, you can replace the foreign dialogue sound and it would still pan. So uh, the, there's the ability that gravity can play in any language and, and George Clooney or whoever's playing George Clooney would still be right here. That, Speed, workflow, and innovation is, is just is going to continue to build and continue to build, and the cinema experience will get greater and greater and greater until we probably have you know holographs moving around the room with the sound. But you know, there'll still be a, a very um, you know healthy respect for for the theater and cinema experience versus a home experience. And I don't think that's um, I think I don't think we can separate the sound though, Mike, from yeah. from the picture. We can. Yeah create this great 4K image, but without that sound experience, we don't have that other, uh, those other layers of depth that, 
that belong to cinema. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, but you're right. I mean, that's part of trying to create more of the immersive experience. So exactly, the bigger panel, you're closer to it. You're immersed in the image. You want to yes. have the more of an immersive yeah. experience. Yeah, and it may also be that um, that the our cinema experience uh, of the future is is going to be a better. Uh, 3D experience as well as a result, uh, because uh, you know dual uh, 4K images um, can create more depth within the image itself. It's almost like it, with motion picture film, you had that sense that you were kind of diving into the image, which you didn't really get with the that kind of flattened video look, but. Um, the newer sensor technology with more pixels in a smaller area uh, seems to give you back a little of that depth and of course the color space and, and, um, and resolution add to that. Well and some other things to think about, I mean uh, especially on the 3D side, for instance he talked about gravity and uh, did anyone see gravity in 3D in the theater? Mm -hmm. So just so you guys know that actually wasn't shot in 3D. Right. Um, that, and that was probably the best 3D movie I've seen. So think about like where that application is in terms of the theater is you don't even need to shoot 3D to do better 3D than most movies do 3D. <laughs> so, you know, think about that. And then, you know, in terms of like the theatrical experience, one thing that you guys can start thinking about as kind of younger filmmakers is, well, you don't have a cinema in your living room where you can do screenings, but you all have laptops and you all have HDMI outs and um, you also all have AirPlay where, you know, if you get an Apple TV, right, you can go and run an Apple TV over AirPlay through a projector and go out to a large screen which in 1080. And at some point, I imagine you're gonna be able to do that in 4K. So literally, mobile projection, outdoor filmmaking, some of these other things, I mean, I think you're gonna be able to be far more creative in the theatrical experience and introduce different elements than what you're just seeing in the multiplex. Sa Samuel Jabris, and I have a question. Uh, overall, how much will it be to watch the 4K quality with including like screens and all of that stuff? At home? Are you, are you saying? Where? Uh, how, how much will it be to enjoy the 4K quality? Like with all the screens, with uh, as you said before, and such. So, what's the cost for the home uh, purchaser, the consumer? It depends. Yeah, I was <laughs> going to say, uh, I can say this: the price is coming down, uh, as it always does on the consumer side, very, very quickly. Uh, you could pick up a 55-inch uh, 4K TV now for probably around $4,000, $3,000, somewhere in that range. Uh, so pick a moment in time, the price will just keep on dropping. Uh, there's a lot of competitive models out there, uh, difference in quality inputs and IOs and all that other, difference in uh, dynamic range. But the price is coming down and it's going to be very accessible uh, to the consumer. Uh, I think it is now, but it's going to even become more so. As Sam pointed out before, even the cameras, uh, we introduced at CES a Handycam 4K camera for $2,000. So it's just come down very, very quickly. And yeah, I mean, on the panel side, uh, if, you, if you wanted, you could get a panel, 4K panel, I think it's something like 48 inches for like $650. And the simplest thing in the world, and I wouldn't necessarily recommend buying that panel, but um, you know, between six hundred fifty and eight thousand dollars, if you need to just do a resolution check, that's probably you know the the price point, depending on the quality of the panel that you need to get. And all you need to do, if you want to, what the the easiest way to check 4K content basically right now is get a MacBook Pro, hook it up over. Uh, the new Retina MacBook Pro and hook it up over HDMI to a 4K TV and just start watching 4K YouTube Literally right out of your uh, out of your HDMI port We had a question here. Yes. Yeah um, What is the refresh rate of all the 4K TVs? Are they gonna go more than 240 Hertz? So well the, He's talking about the, re the refresh rate for the screens 
I got to get to 60 at some point. But. Yeah, I was told with 60, 4K 60. Uh, the assumption, there, there's a lot of discussions on the professional side that if you shoot native 4K, uh, what should the, uh, the frame rate be? That's on the camera side. I mean, on the, uh, obviously, as you have it on the camera side, you'll eventually have to get on a TV side. And it's a long debate. Uh, so mm -hmm. let's just say, uh, as we can achieve it, it'll continue to go up. Uh, we'll leave it at that. It only gets better. But yeah, we'll start with 4K60. Yeah, and that's, you know, I think 4K, well, it's also going to depend on the medium, too, because I think yeah. sports at 4K60 makes a lot more sense than yeah. cinema, necessarily. Mm -hmm. So, it literally, it's going to depend on, on the medium and what the application is and what the sweet spot is for that particular, for what you want to do. So, you know, probably in a perfect world, you'd be able to work at multiple different refresh rates and um, not have an issue. I mean, that's the holy grail, I think, is to just be plug and play and, you know. But right now, you need to be kind of aware of some of that stuff. And usually it's 24 or 30 is where, where you're dealing with in displays. And, but really, I don't think there are that many people that are working in 4K 60 yeah. yet. Yeah. But it's coming. So, you know, I don't know. The more you, the more you think you know, the, the less you actually realize you know. There's an artistic part to that, of course, and then, of course, there's the overall quality. But I think you heard a lot more about refresh rate in the HD world because they were always looking at to try to increase the quality yeah. with its own limitations in HD. Uh, with 4K, uh, the demand for that is not there yet, but the industry will always keep on pushing. Hi, my name's Sam. Uh, I'm not actually a film student. I'm in game art. But I was wondering, what are the restrictions for moving into 8K and 16K? File size. <laughs> well, uh, how are you going to play it back? Yeah. Is the, uh, and then also the amount of space, yeah. you know, that it's, that it's going to require. So technically, there's really no limitation in terms of doing it. It's, it's purely a workflow thing. I mean, you know, Final Cut 10 at the moment is completely resolution independent. You could work in an 8K timeline if you wanted to. Now the question is, where are you going to get the 8K camera, and um, how big are those files going to be, and what codec and what resolution? So you know, your limitations are not in terms of kind of whether you can do it. It's the the gear that's out there and how practical it is. Now on the 8K camera, I will say the F65, Sony F65 bad full sale actually can spit out 8K. Now, it, it, but there's a business side to everything, and there's a, uh, the reality is that you go up in file size, it's expensive. It takes up a lot Very of storage, yep. and there has to be some gain. So always be thinking ROI. What am I getting in return for my investment? And uh, right now, uh, 4K is the sweet spot. And, but you go beyond that, as Sam pointed, you don't have the surrounding tools to support that edit and finishing. Uh, but also what do you gain on the TV side or the consumer side? No one can view it. The, um, and kind of an example that's, that's in a different world uh, is that it, uh, storage space is a big issue, um, meaning hard drive space or flash drive space. And a good example of this is that the, in order to image the brain, there, on this brain research project, trying to image the entire human brain uh, in a 3D model. And they estimate that it would take the current existing storage in the entire world to image one brain. It would take that much at the resolution that they're, they're doing it, which I believe is a 16-bit image at, at 4K or 8K. Oh. Uh, and, and so, we haven't figured out a way yet in this world to, to store that kind of data uh, in large volumes. And, you, and if you have a user base of thousands of users that you have to spit this out to, um, then, then where's that all going to go? <laughs> all those large uh, data so How are you going to move it? And how are you going to move <laughs> yeah. it around, yes. Yeah, we're still in the Wild West when it comes to the web. So oh, yeah. we're we're still to see a lot of changes there. 
Uh, hello, yes, my name is Jedediah Brown. I'm actually a music business student here also. Uh, and I'm into film also. You know, I like to watch a lot of TV and a lot of movies and things of that nature. And the question I have, I guess, is, <laughs> is it necessary that everything be shot in 4K or in such of a high resolution because um, films like Twilight and all those different films that have those different kinds of uh, or looks or styles or filter, I guess, the way that it looks like, you know, light or whatever. Will all of these things being shot in 4K make everything kind of look the same? Or, w or would it be harder to manipulate to get that look that you're looking for? The film. Uh, I think that's pretty easy to, to um, address. If you think of all the films that you ever saw uh, growing up that are archived from the beginning of film history to now, uh, they're hundreds of looks. Every film has a different look. And, but they were all shot on a similar base, film stock, you know, on you know, Kodak stock. And uh, so it was the uh, vision of the cinematographer uh, and the editors and the colorists and you know, the timers that made the difference in how that particular film looked. So I don't think the medium itself is the problem. I, not necessarily, no, no. Some things don't belong in 4K. If you're putting things on the web, you know. Yeah, I mean, what's, what's the purpose? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's just a resolution, you know. I mean, it, there's so many other things that go into actually making content. I mean, it's just a, it's just a format. And even within that 4K format, there's multiple different flavors and aspect ratios within that. So in terms of everything looking the same, it's like, that it would almost be like saying, well, everything that's on 35 millimeter film is the same. It's just, it's, just kind of the canvas, you know, and then the, mm -hmm. you're kind of, there's, it's the craft that's gonna actually decide the look and, and the feel of things. So, you know, um, and in terms of whether everything needs to be in 4K, no, I mean, it's, it's an option that you have and now it's an option that is actually a lot simpler than people really think it is to do it. But if you tell a good story, you know, it doesn't really, the resolution kind of doesn't matter. I was just going to say that yeah, technology, technology is just meant to give you creative freedom. Mm -hmm. well, that's, it's opening up that chest drove for you to dive into. Don't confuse technology with uh, storytelling and creativity. It's actually there to unleash the creativity. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, you said it. I mean, they are all tools, I and mean, so you can shoot in 4K and you know, the F-65 or an Epic, and, you know, you might need a shot that you can only get with a GoPro. <laughs> Absolutely. Cut it yeah. in, you know, and, and there's a lot of ways of making these various cameras. Or a security but, camera. Or <laughs> sure. Yeah, sure. But, you know, a guy like David Fincher, you know, mm -hmm. he wants to shoot a certain look, and he shoots wide open on really fast lenses and just stacks up a whole bunch of ND filters until he gets the exposure that he wants and has the shallow depth of field. So, it's a tool. This is for everybody in the panel. I'm Maximus Moretta, I'm in the film program. And my question is that, like, there are certain companies that are, I would say, embracing 4K and a lot of new technology within, like, $3,000 and below range, but the big two, like Canon and Nikon, aren't doing that. Is there any reason you guys feel that that, that is? Hmm. I don't know. Um, well, <laughs> actually, Canon is does does do 4K. Uh, yeah. They're just not particularly good at it yet. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, the raw isn't you know it's not practical on that level. So, I think a lot of it is is workflow, and a lot of it is just getting to the point where they figure out the manageable way to to do that. So, I mean, the individual companies can answer that a little bit better, but you know, Ari, for instance, is definitely going towards 4K. Um, as is, uh, Canon already does it. Sony and, and Red do it very well, I think. And um, Blackmagic is about to drop their 4K, 4K camera. And, you know, it's, that's where the puck is going. Um, so that's so to speak. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I think that uh, one of the things you have to consider is that um, the uh, Nikon and Canon are, come from a still um, 
camera background. And so they're not going to invest that money into it until they see a viable market growing. Uh, they tend to be fairly conservative and not necessarily out there on the forefront in terms of camera development. Um, they, uh, they make a, a, mar a product that fits a particular market, and they're moving people up from their still cameras up to their um, um, you know, video-capable cameras. And so it's a different market. Uh, thank you very much, and that'll be it.